It's a great pleasure to be here. And I have to say I'm a bit envious of you all for getting to spend this time together. Uh, I'm a big supporter of ACSS uh, and particularly of the Next Generation program. I had the opportunity to be a facilitator many years ago in my younger days, um, and I learned a great deal from the discussions, um, group discussions, which bring together such a diverse set of people and experiences, uh, and focusing on some really tough questions. Um, among my favorites were, you know, is there ever a good coup? Uh, uh, what does it mean to defend the Constitution? And what happens when that conflicts with the, the, the principle of abiding by civilian oversight? Um, how should we think about integrating security forces after a civil conflict? And to have people from both North and South Cote d'Ivoire at one session and from Burundi and from other countries, from Mali, Niger, fascinating discussions. So I'm, I'm hoping uh, you find the discussions as enriching as I did. Today I've been asked to talk about Africa's evolving security landscape. That is a very big topic on a very big and diverse continent. So forgive me if I tend, if I inadvertently go into some generalizations. Uh, I would say overall that security challenges in Africa have been more complex and our definition of security is expanding. But to simplify, I'll talk about three things. First, what, are the, what is the fundamental or what are the unchanging constant factors? Uh, what are the things that are changing and evolving? Uh, and what are the priorities and principles um, that at least I think should underpin our security responses? So first, on the constant or structural drivers. I think there is one key one in the interest of time. I'll just focus on that. Uh, and this is not surprising, it's true in Africa and it's true the world over. This is the absence or the unraveling of a basic social compact. That is the basic agreement between citizens and the state, that the state will abide by a set of agreed upon norms and rules and responsibilities, applied and available to all citizens without bias or favor, and that in return, citizens will abide by the rule of law, grant the state legitimacy to govern, and importantly, to have a monopoly on the legitimate use of force. In that, I feel that the burden is on the state to build that confidence and win that legitimacy and to continually renew it uh, through its behavior, through its engagement with citizens, and I think to test it through regular elections that are free and fair and, and credible. Um, this principle of a compact holds at the national level, it also holds at the international level, where states agree to abide by certain norms and mutual respect. Now, this is true the world over. There are, are, are reasons why it can be particularly problematic in parts of Africa, and I would say in the Middle East, the colonial experience has a lot to do with that borders drawn, not with the interests of citizens or eventual states nation states in mind, but with the interests of colonial uh, uh, occupiers whose, whose motive was to extract resources and control populations. Uh, and to do so, they would often privilege one group over another uh, to, to control, let's say, on the cheap, as we say. Um, the result of this, and I think in some ways uh, actions of external, fact, uh, external players during the Cold War, United States and the Soviet Union included, helped reinforce some of these, the bad incentives uh, for, for leaders by rewarding kind of ideological leanings not service to citizens. But the results have been uh, the failure to kind of build social cohesion in some states, again, not all, uh, a collective vision among citizens they're, thereby leaving weak governments, weak institutions, uh, and political elites who seek to empower themselves and enrich themselves uh, to extract rents and to cr control dissent. Um, institutions are often, as I said, weak, and they're often built to serve the interests of a, an elite or a, a few and not truly national in nature. 
So it's never going to be possible to eliminate insecurity, but that social compact and that constant striving to renew that social compact, it's, it's a long and never ending process, but it's essential. So that's the constant. What are some of the things that have been changing and, and changing the nature of some of the security threats? What are the, the catalysts, the amplifiers, and the mitigators, I'll call them? Demographic growth, population growth, and research, resource scarcity are uh, among them, a big one. Uh, rising pressure and competition for land, for water, for freedom of movement. So you have uh, herdsmen versus farmers. You have agro-business versus uh, displaced populations, uh, creating intercommunal uh, uh, strife. Corruption levels, you know, the corruption has, has been an issue for a very long time. The levels of corruption and rent seeking by political elites has gone up. The continent loses $60 billion uh, of, of resources to corruption annually, every single year. That's enough to power the, to, to fill the electricity gap of Africa. If that was applied, every, you would have universal access uh, to energy in, in Africa. And this is part due to uh, colluding leaders. It is also partly due uh, to external actors and weak institutions to, to govern them. A third is the rising expectations among citizens of a participatory, equitable governance that expands economic opportunity and holds political elites accountable. Democracy and participatory government is becoming something of a norm, uh, and every government now kind of in, holds regular elections, although sometimes they're delayed. But without the fundamental elements of freedom of expression, freedom of assembly, uh, the integrity of the process, the impartiality of the referees, uh, those are the things that make democracy work and that basic compact and social, uh, uh, social uh, norm. So you have a rising tension as those expectations of governance and participation rise, and as elites uh, who, who have not built that legitimacy push back, and that leads, that's led to rising frictions. The rise of transnational uh, challenges. Transnational issues have always been a big part of African insecurity. If you think of Liberia, Cote d'Ivoire, Guinea, uh, Sierra Leone, that whole conflict system. If you think of DRC, which at one point had eight uh, different countries intervening in different ways. Uh, if you think of apartheid South Africa seeking to destabilize uh, neighboring states, there's often been this transnational nature. But now external influences have amplified uh, the resources, the levels of violence, um, and, and the scope. Narcotics cartels uh, from South America, uh, a, a multi-billion dollar industry. International wildlife trafficking networks, again, a multi-billion dollar enterprise that is more sophisticated, more militarized, and more deadly. You have global terror networks that inspire and mobilize followers uh, through a distorted religious narrative that legitimizes violence against civilians. And I think even one could argue external military interventions um, and support, which if not carefully calibrated and structured, can reinforce bad practices or authoritarian governance. A couple of other factors, I don't know how I'm doing on time. <laughs> new technologies, eight minutes? Okay, good. Uh, technologies, new technologies that can be used to mobilize actors, that, that those can be a, a, a very positive force um, in mobilizing civil society and communicating with citizens. Uh, social media has been used very effectively by civil society groups, but also by governments. Uh, the Nigerian government during the last and the previous two elections uh, used those platforms um, to get critical information out, for example. Um, changing regional and continental norms. This is a slow process, but uh, it is, it is, you know, the, the legitimacy of a military coup uh, that is that is no longer acceptable among African states. Still, some debate around uh, constitutional changes to extend your stay in power 
ECOWAS pushing in one direction, other leaders pushing in others. Uh, that's not resolved. But again, these are things that take time. I think a different and, and on a positive note, uh, more strategic uh, thinking on the part of leaders in terms of economic growth and development and big opportunities, uh, even for those countries that are not resource rich, um, to kind of break out uh, in, 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 uh, in, in with heightened growth rates. The manifestations of all these different catalysts and amplifiers are mean that security threats that you all face are much more complex and variegated. Asymmetric attacks against the most vulnerable and remote communities. Uh, you have insurgent groups and terror groups and then hybrid insurgent terror groups uh, that ma make it very difficult. Rise of intercommunal conflict, uh, increasingly militarized and armed. Massive flows of displaced and refugees. Uh, food insecurity that is both a contributor and a result of insecurity. And I think of the Lake Chad region right now, uh, which uh, is kind of cut off from humanitarian assistance. People have not been able to farm. There, there have been all kinds of linkages between insecurity and food security. And then elections as flashpoints. Elections are moments when, when these internal divisions crystallize in people's minds. Just look. Just look at um, the election that we're having here in the United States. Uh, these are moments when those differences within society uh, come out, and it's really up to the institutions and the process to contain that. So what are, the, what are some of the solutions? I mean, none of these are particularly easy. But if you have new and complex threats, you need new skills and capacities and new approaches. I think in terms of capacities, this, the asymmetric attacks that, uh, and, and threats that we face uh, obviously need much stronger intelligence, surveillance, and rec reconnaissance um, cap capabilities, rapid response capacity, logistics, communication strategies, uh, interoperability with regional forces, uh, since this is not something that one national, one national military or security force can, can do by itself. But more important than the security capacities is how they're used. Engagement with communities that will be your best source of intelligence um, and assistance. Um, conflict diffusion and prevention. You know, the military is not always the best tool to diffuse conflicts. You know, you have, there are, uh, uh, you know, the, the idea and the notion of some form of community policing is critically important. Civilian protection as kind of a core, core priority and ethical focus of the military, I think, is, is crucial. Um, in terms of institutions, it means that, again, the military has to be one tool that is used in a very calibrated, targeted way. It should not be the tool of first resort. Uh, there are, for first, you need social mechanisms to diffuse conflicts. You need channels of dialogue between government and citizens. Community policing is another aspect of this. Um, and, and a military that is trusted and security forces that are trusted and have the confidence of, of people. Institutions, and this goes uh, to, uh, particularly in the military, I'll speak to the military, but it goes for, for every institution, have to be really determined to be national and impartial in scope. There need to be clear rules, uh, and it, for the military this would mean use of force, for example, uh, civilian oversight, uh, checks and balances, and with those clear rules, there also has to be clear and impartial mechanisms of accountability. So military justice are, are those who violate those rules held to account. Um, I think you know, one th the, the military ethic is critically important, how the military sees itself and its place in society. Uh, that should be a, a, a place of pride uh, and, and I think the esprit de corps that, that motivates many militaries is, is important, an esprit de corps that transcends ethnic differences or regional differences and so forth. Um, 
for the military, I believe it means kind of a sense of duty and service, uh, not uh, not simply uh, a, 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 a charge to control and protect the regime. And I think particularly because the, because the military and other security forces are given that monopoly on the means of violence and coercion, those security forces need to be held to a much higher standard um, uh, of integrity and accountability than than other um, than other institutions and other civilians uh, in the, in the country. I will end there. I think the the critical point is that the idea of national, inclusive, and impartial institutions, and that fundamental social compact that lies at the heart um, of security and stability. Thank you.